Tuesday the 16th of May. I do want to extend uh, our deepest sympathies and condolences to the whānau and the friends and the colleagues of those uh, who have lost their lives this morning. Greens co-leader James Shaw on the deadly fire at Loafers Lodge. Mr Speaker, I am also very, very angry. The questions in my mind are what kind of country are we that we allow uh, this kind of thing to happen to our most vulnerable uh, members of our community? Uh, What kind of country are we uh, where those people have so few options in life uh, but to live in substandard accommodation uh, with a reasonable chance of lethality? The fire claimed the lives of five men. All were aged between 50 and 67. Some of Wellington's most vulnerable people, many of whom lost all of their possessions in the fire. Those who survived gathered at a welfare centre in Newtown Park. But the question is... Where to next? I don't know where I'm going tonight. And he's not alone. A lot of uncertainty, because we don't know where we're going or if there's going to be room for emergency housing for us and that. Kia ora, I'm Sarah Robson, and today on The Detail, the fire at Loafers Lodge has put the spotlight on where we house some of our country's most vulnerable people. Why do they end up in unsafe and insecure housing? And what needs to change to ensure they get the support they need? Can I first of all get you to introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Greg. Uh, I work for LifeWise. I am a peer support worker and um, I spent a little while on the living on the street, um, probably about 10 years or so. How did you end up living on the street for such a long time? It's a really long story. Um, Luckily we've got time. Oh, have we? Yeah. Okay. Um, We're at the LifeWise office in central Auckland. LifeWise is an organisation helping people in hardship, including those experiencing homelessness. I used to live in Hawke's Bay, um, had worked two jobs, uh, spent 17 years in hospital, made a lot of money, had a gambling habit. I used to play poker, um, started off playing small and then ended up playing once a month in really big clothes games where you sit down with 50k and then, you know, you spend whatever after that. And um, I broke my one rule and I lost $875,000 on the turn of a card. I've never asked for help, ever. So I just um, sort of didn't tell anyone and left, put four names in a hat, drew one out, it was Auckland and so I came here. And uh, got a job in a warehouse, and um, I hurt my back, and couldn't work anymore. But I did it outside of work, so I wasn't eligible for ACC. Oh. Yeah. So I used to go to an internet cafe, and because um, I'm an addicted gamer, and um, I just sort of started going to the cafe and never left. Um, just packed a bag full of stuff and stayed at the cafe for a little while until I ran out of money. Well, all, you know, almost ran out of money. Spent most of my savings and uh, ended up on the street pretty much after that. I mean, at what point did you ask for help? So I was never big on asking for help. Probably three years living on the street and still refused to um, go to work and income and get a benefit because I'd never been on a benefit before. I was lucky enough to meet two other guys who taught me how to survive, because I didn't know what I was going to do. I mm. uh, didn't know where to find stuff. And they used to get money through you know, different ways. And I ended up washing windows with them on the, on the, at the lights yeah. in West Auckland for oh, probably two years. Mm-hmm. And then we were, we were living around Avondale, and two outreach people from Auckland City Mission came mm. and they found us and said, look, you know, you, you guys, if you need any help, come and see us. We've heard that, you know, you're not on a benefit and all that sort of stuff. We can help you with that. So one of them was Alana and her and her mentor, the person that taught her, came out to West Auckland and they found us. And so we went into the mission and they helped us get on a benefit. So, fast forward to about 20, 
16, I yep. suppose. And um, I met uh, a couple of guys who were part of a design team to design a program called Housing First. Housing First helps people experiencing chronic homelessness into permanent housing and provides them with tailored wraparound support, the sort of support many of the men in hostels like Loafers Lodge struggle to find. So I went along to a couple of the design sessions to watch them, you know, how they were mapping stuff and putting it together. And uh, I became one of the first 16 people on the Housing First program. So that's how I went from the street to a house. Do you think you would have got from the street to a house without, you know, those those interventions that were made? First, Alana, an outreach to get you a benefit, and then I guess the people who came back to you for housing first. Do you think there was any way of you getting into permanent housing without them? Probably not, because I was, like I said, I was never big on asking for help. So, you know, it took... It took a lot to to finally, and a lot of self-reflection too, mm. you know, because you have to you have to understand the problem before you can help fix it, and or find ways to fix it. And some people never want to fix it. Now Greg works with people facing the same struggles he once faced. I think after about six months, I realised that this is probably what I was supposed to do. So I used my story to help people understand that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. You just have to find your way there Mm. and accept help. And there are many different reasons why people fall into these situations. There's a lot of things with the people that we work with. Some grew up in boys' homes. Yep. You know, some um, hospitals through mental health. Um, Others have had such bad home lives that they just came straight out on the streets when they were really young and never left. Um, some have just been in and out of prison their whole lives because they didn't know any other way, you know, and that's what they saw around them, so that's what they did. There's lots of different circumstances, as well as things like um, addictions. and So, yeah, there's not, there's not one, one reason, you know. There's all sorts of different reasons. It just depends on the people that... And trying to unpack that is the hard part. Aho te manitake o te tāpui a te whai, uh, ko Helen Robinson tōkuingua. My name is Helen Robinson and I am the Auckland City Missioner. Helen's been Auckland City Missioner since 2021. She oversaw the opening of the mission's most ambitious project to date. So uh, we're sitting here, Sarah, at a building that we have called Home Ground, or has been named Home Ground, which is based here in Hobson Street in Central City, Auckland. It's uh, an extraordinary building that's um, 11 storeys high. There's a whole range of services that are delivered here. So we have a medical centre, a community kitchen, um, we have social work services, a pharmacy, two floors of detox, one run by us and the other by Te Whata Ora. And then a really important part of this building is that we have 80 apartments here, so five storeys of apartments and then a beautiful rooftop for the residents of the apartments. I guess one of the things that I've been thinking about after the Loafers Lodge fire and the five people who were tragically killed in that, they were all older men, clearly things in their lives hadn't always been perfect and they'd ended up somewhere like Loafers Lodge, which for many of us, we look at that and we're like, that is not an ideal housing situation. How have we let these people down? I guess, what do you see in terms of the people coming through the doors at the mission who are men who are in vulnerable positions? What's going on in their lives? I uh, I really do want to acknowledge by um, starting with exactly as you have, Sarah Ashley, just acknowledging the tragedy of Loafers Lodge. And um, I know, uh, obviously, as the situation was unfolding for us here at the mission and uh, people who are supporting homeless people more broadly, um, it, it was a very, very hard watch, actually. It's important, I think, to acknowledge it at the front end of any conversation about this is the failure of New Zealand, Uh, for 40 years 
to actually create um, enough good housing that's appropriate, that's affordable for us all. So it's always helpful, I think, at a simple um, analysis to say what are the drivers of homelessness. And uh, the first, which is very, very clear, is poverty. So those who have access to resource have access to a house and a home that's affordable and appropriate. And uh, those who don't, don't. And what we're seeing, uh, particularly in most recent years, is that there are a growing number of people who don't have access to affordable, appropriate housing. Secondly, um, and particularly people who suffer street homelessness or super vulnerable um, in their lives and realities, it's the impact of trauma. Um, and trauma can have um, many, many beginning forms. I think structurally we're acknowledging particularly uh, the impact of colonisation. So overwhelmingly in New Zealand it is Māori who are disproportionately suffering the reality of homelessness and there is a direct link between um, alienation from land to lack of housing. So I, I think there's that understanding. Then the shape of trauma um, beyond that is different for every individual and family but often speaks to the reality of violence, particularly uh, in the lives of children and young people. So I've said before, if New Zealand could deal with its violence problem, we would go a long way to uh, addressing the trauma that is one of the key drivers of homelessness. Um, then from that, and sometimes it's in a chicken or egg situation, it's hard to know what starts what, mm. but the reality of, of mental illness, the reality of addiction, the impact of uh, ill health, and then I think to um, social dislocation or particularly where relationships and significant relationships are broken down. So it would not be an unusual story that we would see, uh, as your question asked, men who came in who were previously uh, partners, uh, fathers, um, something has happened significantly to that relationship. They have become uh, disconnected and dislocated from their whānau, uh, perhaps are quite unwell in one way, shape or form, lose an income, and then it's very, very easy to see how you can uh, become um, or be just suffering the reality of homelessness. Um, so uh, at the mission here, um, uh, we have a service here called Hayata, which is open every day of the year where we provide one good meal for people here in Central City, Auckland. And then as they come in here, they can access, of course, associated services. So we have a medical centre here, a pharmacy, there's social workers to support people into housing. Um, on a busy day here, we can have 300 people through. Mm, that's a uh, lot. It's a, it's a really lot. On a quiet day, we'd be 150, 160. Um, and it's not the same 300 people every day. Mm. I think that's important. That there may be, uh, there's certainly a small part or cohort of that group that we would be seeing every day. But there are people that we may only see once or twice or see only for a period of three or four months. In terms of numbers at the mission, coming into Hayata... Is it a fairly even split between men and women seeking help? or There would be about somewhere between 60 to 70% of people who we see are men, mm. um, which is really interesting and, and begs a much bigger story, actually. Um, in the 2018 uh, census, there was an analysis of housing deprivation done, mm. and uh, actually that showed that 100,000 people in that census uh, were part of what's called severely housing deprived, so a very formal and specific definition of homelessness, and 50% of those are women. So what's very, very interesting then is, is that in that much bigger picture, uh, because we know that is the data, why are we only seeing 60 or 70 per cent are men and 20 or 30 per cent uh, or 30 or 40 per cent are women? And that speaks to the nature of women's homelessness, which is more hidden and more subtle. Mm, interesting, interesting, because as we were talking before I hit the record button, when I was RNZ Social Issues reporter, so much of my focus was on women, uh, single women, raising children, um, and and that aspect of poverty, and particularly child poverty. And I guess in my reporting, I'd never really focused on on men, but I feel, I feel like Lofus Lodge has almost brought that to the forefront. And what's happening in terms of providing um, this group of people with the wraparound support that they need to deal with those underlying issues in terms of poverty, in terms of employment, in terms of 
having a safe, stable place to live. We know that um, all of us need access to appropriate, affordable, adequate housing. Then some of us at different parts in our life need support to be sustained in that tenancy, depending on what's going on. So it's that notion, but then uh, really deepened, I think, when we are, are seeking to support people who have a range or depth and complexity of need. So uh, how do we genuinely support someone who uh, is very, very mentally unwell Um, and obviously not unwell enough to be in hospital or in any kind of supported care, but actually uh, quite capable of sustaining permanent tenancy with appropriate support? And then that, that is the deeply the work of the mission and many other good agencies throughout our country who are providing that appropriate level of care. I think what something like Loafers Lodge is showing us actually is, or showing the greater New Zealand, is that actually that support is not rocket science. We actually just need to acknowledge that uh, people need it and we need to set up uh, service systems and, and funding systems that enable appropriate support to all the people who need it. Now, I think New Zealand is actually learning, one, how possible it is to support people, but actually that it's difficult and it's time-consuming and that it does require resource to do it. Is it a case where some of these people, you know, they might be supported into getting a room in a place like Loafers Lodge, but then that's it, it's hands off, no more support beyond, hey, we've helped you into a house, tick, job done? Totally. So if you or I had nowhere to stay tonight, Sarah, we would go to an MSD office and uh, very genuinely they would be very good to us. They would find um, some kind of emergency housing probably for us and perhaps if, if, um, if there was one available, we'd go into some kind of transitional housing. Now, um, the system is not set up to designed at that front end, at that very, very point of entry, to actually provide uh, an assessment of the level of need. Um, so uh, actually the first job of an MSD, or really the only job of an MSD worker, is to support that person into uh, some kind of emergency dwelling. Um, but this is where life starts to get complex a bit though, is that, that our preference is always for permanent housing. And we just don't, there's just not enough places to put people. Mm. And there are also significant resource limits put on the amount of people that we can support. And of course, since Labor came into government back in 2017, there has been this uh, focus on, um, obviously with Jacinda Ardern, reducing child poverty. What we want to do is get beyond the political back and forth around what measures of child poverty are in this country. There was a homelessness action plan. The government says it'll fund a thousand new transitional housing places to shift people out of emergency motels. A public housing build program. Today's housing package creates 8,000 additional public or transitional housing places over the next four to five years. I mean, we haven't seen many of these ideas come to fruition or come to fruition fast enough. Is there any way we can make it happen quicker? Or? So if New Zealand can get on board this boat and actually say we want a different construct, what I think we would see is a plethora of responses open up very, very quickly, different entities and individuals taking responsibility and uh, the government uh, doing everything within their power to support it. Um, and, you know, some of the stuff that you uh, spoke about even then briefly with COVID, I remember the period very, very quickly in that very first lockdown, um, just how extraordinary um, the Ministry of Housing and Urban Development and MSD were to make anything possible for mm. us. So we were entering into really quick decisions that were high trust that were bringing people off the street uh, into motels, which is not fabulous, but in that, particularly in the middle of that pandemic and that first lockdown, better than people being on the street. And some amazing stuff was achieved. We almost saw the possibilities of what can happen when there's momentum behind it. And the will, and the will of the people and the collective to actually do it. Um, uh, and I, you know, I sit here at home ground and half of the cost of the apartments was given to us uh, through the national government with Sue Bill English and 
uh, the cost of the two detox flo- floors were given to us through the Labour Coalition and then we got a further grant uh, through the, the current Labour Government under the Crown Infrastructure Grants or Shovel Ready Money. So Home Ground here is a really, really good example, interestingly, of successive governments at different p- parties in the House actually supporting a collective. And um, the mission, you know, I'm our biggest believer and supporter, but we're nothing special in the sense that there are many other entities throughout our country that are doing extraordinary things in the response to housing. So I think it's a good example of what can happen when we partner. And it does require both civil society, government, uh, private enterprise and the NGO world coming together and saying what is the parts of our expertise that know the wisdom that each one of us hold to actually meet these needs and how can we do it quickly. I guess what would your message be to people who might be in an in that sort of isolated situation? I guess what what would be your advice to them, having sort of been in that position before? Don't be afraid to ask for help. Always. I mean, we're not mind readers, so and until until they can take that first step, we can't help them. They need, to, they need to be able to ask for help and say what they need, not what they think we want to hear. At Home Ground, they've recently marked a year of people living in their apartments. I recently joined the tenants for our one-year celebration and it was a, um, a, a very uh, low-key and formal and moving ceremony, actually, where a number of tenants got up and spoke about just how uh, wonderful it was for them to be here. So spe- people spoke about feeling safe for the first time in mm. their life, um, about um, being delighted about being able to have a place they call a home. Uh, one of the things that happens that's really lovely is every tenant here, when they first come, they are given a pop plant that's actually grown on our rooftop and I uh, had a lovely conversation with one of our tenants one day who was just telling me in detail about how much her pot plant had grown and you knew that what it was really was a symbol for, for actually what had happened for her. Uh, people are describing realities where they're attending to their health where they're actually starting to have conversations about um, either study or part-time employment or realities that months ago without this kind of housing and support just wouldn't have been possible. So that event or ceremony, its uh, I mean, that's what I and so many of us here do what we do. That's it for today. I'm Sarah Robson. The detail is supported by the Public Interest Journalism Fund. Today's episode was engineered by Phil Benj and produced by Bonnie Harrison and Mark Jennings. And thanks to Helen Robinson and Greg from LifeWise. Ka kite anō.